everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. It's the beginning of July, which means that I have favorites from the month of June to share with you all. So as usual, I'm going to go through this in a sort of order. I'm going to start with tarot and oracle decks that were my favorite for that month, and then we're going to get into the books that I read and are my favorite, which is pretty much all of the books I read because I don't finish books that I don't like, or I should say if I don't find value in them. I still read books that I disagree with or that don't jive so well, and there actually is one of those, but yeah, so we'll get into books as our second category, and then magical tools, and then, or magical related items, I should say, or magical related things, and then more lifestyle at the very end. So without further ado, we'll get started in that. I'll start with tarot, then we'll do an oracle deck. There's only one oracle deck this month, this month is pretty straightforward, I think, but I'm actually making a lot of progress in terms of studies, so I'll be sharing that as we go. I'll start with the most obvious, and I think that anybody who has watched a few of my videos or even any of my other favorites videos knows that there's going to be a version of the Thoth in a favorites video for me, because it's always a favorite, or at least it has been for a very long time now, a few months. So this is the trimmed version, the version I trimmed myself, and... The one that I'm usually using for clients and daily draws more often than not, I would say, just because it's convenient on my table and I like the trim version for clients. I've spoken about why that is, but uh, it's just a really multi-purpose deck for me. It's one that I really resonate with and I have been continuing my studies with. It's, it's my jam, it's my cup of tea, and I think it will be for the foreseeable future. So definite favorite and Next, I will get into one that is a new, a newer acquisition. So I was just getting that out of the way quickly because you guys know I talk about it all the time and I don't want to prattle on. So I'm keeping it in this box. I like having just boxes around. I'm a box person. All the better for me if I can store things in nice, nice looking boxes. So I'm always on the lookout for boxes. So that's a favorite too, boxes, especially this one. So this is a deck that I'd mentioned in my favorite Pip decks video. It was rel It's relatively new to my collection, uh, the Masonic Tarot. It's out of print, it's from the 80s. It's, it's just such a lovely deck. There's so much here. I'm so into the idea of the Freemasons and Freemasonry as a, a secret society or the more, I would say, esoteric and yeah, esoteric sort of symbolism that's ingrained in a lot of their work. So there's something here that's very, it feels secret, it feels hidden, it feels highly symbolic, it feels like there's a lot to unpack. For similar reasons that I like the Thoth Tarot and I would say decks of that vein, that's the reason I like this deck. And so it's not one that's readily or easily accessible online just because it's out of print. But if you come across it and this looks interesting to you, I recommend going for it. There's, like, look at the detailing. There's, like, glimmer of gold. It's not quite metallic or reflective. The majors are amazing. The minors are pips. I mentioned it in my favorite pips video. But I've enjoyed it for more practical matters. So looking, taking the idea of Freemasonry as a sort of secret society that took concepts of actual masonry, physical, as a craft, as an art, like a sort of artisanship, and taking that into a more secret society, not secret society, but taking it to a more esoteric and spiritualized level where a lot of those concepts held value that was greater than their mundane or practical counterparts. So I'll look at this for practical matters. And in looking at those practical matters, I'm hoping to uncover something deeper. So I can look at, say, daily tasks, my routines, and sort of investigate them through the lens of this card or make choices through the lens of these cards and uncover something more to it. The, the ideas of fulfillment or making choices that are right for me, I love using this for making choices and evaluating based on the various cards that come up and trying to really work with the pips for what they are just because I'm not somebody who naturally seeks out very pippish decks and uh, yeah. I don't really consider the Thoth Tarot or the Thoth deck to be a pip deck, although I I had this conversation with Anna from Astral Lady Tarot and she asked why it wasn't in 
my favorite pip decks and it didn't even occur to me to put that deck in my favorite pip decks video just because I don't see I don't see it as a pip deck I look at them and I see just so much going on so much scenery so much detail and difference from one card to the next that to me it's almost not even a pip deck so I guess pip decks can be my jam it just has to be the right kind of pip deck so we have that the the masonic tarot next we will get into we'll do this one so i'll put these two together this is the these are i should say the alchemical tarot renewed fourth edition by robert m poise i know the fifth edition's out and the card stock on it looks amazing so i am somewhat interested in getting the fifth edition although i'm not in any rush and then i have the the tarot of the alchemical magnum opus also by robert m poise I know that you can get, no, I think now that the fifth edition's out, I forget where it's accessible through. I'm pretty sure you can get both of these through his website though. So check out his website or look that up, you know, but I love both of these. I have loved both of these for, I've had them both for close to a year. I think this one a little bit less than a year. And I mentioned this one in my, I believe it was back in my council of seven. So this has been a longstanding favorite. So it's kind of re-entering the rotation of decks being used but the primary reason for these two making a comeback this month was it was intentional so in the month of july which is now i'm planning on fully reading i think i brought it i didn't bring it i will be right back i'm intending on reading the the mega the monolith the the tome that is the tarot magic alchemy um, the Tarot, Magic, Alchemy, Hermeticism, and Neoplatonism by Robert M. Poise. I had mentioned in my goals, I've set a tarot, I made a tarot goals video for 2020, and I mentioned that I wanted to fully read this book this year, and so I have been pretty good about achieving my goals, especially in regards to the Thoth Tarot and the studies that I've been doing there, along with the Tabula Mundi Tarot, which was one I wanted to embark on and fully read that book very early on, actually. But now I want to get into this and I've gone through this book. I've read like certain sections and excerpts and bits on certain cards, but I haven't read it from front to back. And I'd really like to, I'd really like to just know more about the ideas of alchemy in terms of tarot. And that can be integrated, I think, into Thoth just because there are a lot of alchemical undertones to the Thoth. And I think into Rider Waite Smith and most tarot decks and systems in general. So this is actually more of a Rider Waite Smith derivative. It's not really a clone, but it follows the the Rider Waite Smith system more, I think, than any other. So it'll be interesting to get back into that just because I haven't been reading with any Rider Waite Smith decks in in recent months. So it'll be a nice refresher. It'll be a nice return to that, and I'm hoping that I can get through it in the month. I think I can. So a little book little book action explaining why it is that I am working with these. They're really lovely decks. Uh, the Alchemical Tarot Renewed 4th Edition is has a lot more uh, scenery going on. There's a lot more to all of the cards overtly. These are the backs. So they're fully illustrated and the the Magnum Opus version is more of a pip deck. There are very minimal illustrations going on in that deck it will just take the core symbol illustrative symbol and attribute it to the pip like illustration of the given card so it's a really lovely deck they're both lovely decks and robert m Poise is a bit of a genius so i am excited to fully dig in although i've been using these decks for quite some time i want to understand them to their fullest and really know the backstory and the inner workings of it all so definitely a favorite next we will get into the last tarot deck which is uh, the tarot of the spirit by who who created this let me make sure by Pamela Eakins and Joyce Eakins I believe that they is it a, I think it's a mother-daughter team that was the creator and the illustrator the little white book I just keep it in a bag and there's the tree of life transparent plastic card that you can overlay on the cards because they were illustrated with the positions of the tree of life in mind so you can 
sort of see how that aligns with the illustration. It's a really beautiful deck. It's a Thoth-based deck. I think I just need to get my hands on all of the, the wonderful Thoth-based decks and experience them for myself. So this was, of course, on the list. I think so far, or in my opinion thus far, the kind of trinity of wonderful Thoth decks for me, or Thoth-based system decks are or have been the actual Thoth, the Tabula Mundi Tarot, and the Tarot of the Spirit, both or all three having a very different feeling to them, all really presiding over or existing within the same system that is the Thoth. And so I'm really enjoying this one. I think that I'm just having fun with it right now, but my plan is to actually read the literature associated with it. So the, the thick guidebook, which I have, and there's also another book written in regards to the Kabbalah and this deck, specifically the Kabbalah and this deck, and it's a separate book from that thick guidebook. So I'd like to read both of those and set aside, I think I'm going to try for August. I know this is a lot of planning, but I'm thinking that's what will be the case. I was feeling inclined to plan out these sorts of things and this deck has just really been, it's caught my attention and I'm really enjoying working with it. And so that's that a definite favorite this month. And so finally, I will get into the one Oracle deck that we have for this month. And this is the, the Oracle of Reflections, or I'm not going to try to say this in French, but Oracle de Reflets. Uh, I don't have a great French accent. And it's by Celia Mellesville. Mellesville. It's a wonderful deck, comes in like this nice hard box. There's the reflect or the metallic quality to all of it. There's a lot of great production behind this deck overall. So that's always a plus. And then it comes in, there's a nice little ribbon to help you get the box out. And a booklet, which there is a French and English version, so you can flip it. Here I'll show you. I'll show you all. So in one side, there's the, the French titles to the cards with a little description, and then I think you have to flip it. Yeah, you literally flip it upside down or flip it the other way and open it from the other side, and then you will get the English version. So that's always nice and handy, although you only get just a, a really tiny or a few key words for each card. So for example, there's the horse, and then you just get arrogance, pride, insolence, vanity, reduced vision. So the deck really wants you to dig into these cards on your own and not rely on the guidebook so much, which is fine by me. It's a really nice exercise in intuition. I love this deck because it feels like this old world, old school, like you're almost reading, you're reading tea leaves at the bottom of a cup in the Victorian era and you're in some shop where there's a mystical woman who wants to tell you your fortune. And that's the, the feeling I get from this deck and that's why I felt so drawn to it. And I will light a candle at night and sometimes pull, this is usually where I will pull a single card and it'll be to reflect on something or almost sometimes I like to use it in that fortune telling aspect. Uh, it feels kind of fun, but there's also an element that's really serious about it as well. And the artwork is beautiful. It has this very vintage, worn and weathered feel to it and there's a lot of meaning and symbolism i mean i should say just deeper intuitive feeling that can go into each and every card the symbolism is not so exact and that's part of the that's part of its charm i think that there's a lot to be drawn and a lot of different avenues you can go down with any of these symbols and keywords so it just feels very old school fortune teller sort of a vibe and I've loved it for that, especially when I'm looking at all these structured tarot decks that are alchemical and Kabbalistic, something that feels more intuitive and fluid and fun, almost fun, but it, there's definitely a seriousness here and a darker element to it. But uh, this is a lot more, this is like a playground. There, I have room to go free with my mind and my, my thoughts and my intuition here. Whereas with the others, there's a lot more rigorous study involved, so the balance is nice to have. And so it's a favorite mostly for that reason.
So that takes us to the end of the decks. Now I will get into the books that were my favorite, which is, yeah, just the books that I read this month. So we will start with, this is the Thoth, um, the Thoth Tarot Astrology and Other Selected Writings by Phyllis Seckler. So she, this book was actually, I got this book because Hanny from Fierce and Pretty, I'll link her channel below. She spoke about this in a video. She has a few really great videos. Actually, she has a lot of great videos on the Thoth Tarot. And she read this book and was speaking on it. I hadn't heard of it. And I was like, I definitely want to read that book based on what she'd said. I read it. I was not disappointed. I think out of all of the books, this is my favorite one of the month. I read three. So this was the one that probably took the most time as well. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a little bit of a thicker book for sure. It's about the actual parts that you would read, I should say. There's, a, there's just over 300 pages, and it's not exactly a quick read. It's not a, like one that you'll speed through. I would say it's somewhere between the writing styles of The Book of Thoth, where Aleister Crowley speaks very metaphorically, figuratively. It's abstract. You're reading between the lines. You're stopping to pause on his words. There's The wording of it is just, it takes you a little bit longer than, say, reading a really a really nice novel or something it's going to take you a little bit with the book of thoth so it's somewhere between his writing style and duquette's understanding alistair crowley's thoth tarot so this is more of the, i would say that this is like the easy read this is i know uh one that a lot of people seek out for the thoth tarot along with the book of thoth so if you've read both of these and you're familiar with them then I would say that the writing style and the pacing and the tone are somewhere in between the two. So she's not speaking in in tongues like Crowley sometimes does. She speaks relatively plainly, but her tone and the topics that she's discussing are, I would say, not for beginners so much. So I would not suggest this as a beginner's Thoth book. It's actually taking into account that you know a bit about astrology and the Thoth tarot and a little bit in terms of uh, the Kabbalah and the Golden Dawn and those sorts of things. So she she speaks on presuming that the reader knows a little bit about those ahead of time. Plus, you're not getting necessarily write-ups on each of the card per se, so it's not so great for learning. But if you already know the basics of the Thoth Tarot, you know the basics of astrology, and you can get by in terms of the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life, then you will gain a lot here. So this would be somebody who's really interested in the Book of Thoth in those sorts of related subjects and has a little bit of a, a foundational knowledge. You don't need a ton, but this will take it to a new level. I really enjoyed this. I think it enhanced my knowledge in all of those fields that I just mentioned. And she has a really interesting way in speaking about the cards that added layers for me that I wouldn't have, I personally wouldn't have thought up or have derived in my own working. So a valuable book for sure for anybody interested in the Thoth. Next, we will get into the second book I read, which was Celtic Magic by DJ Conway. So DJ Conway is a big name. Uh, this book itself is, I want to say it's from the 90s. I could be totally wrong. It's one of those, I would say, I don't know how to like define the era, but it's one of those almost like 90s, wicca type s wicca-esque books so this is definitely through a wiccan lens i have spoken about books that are through a wiccan lens but don't overtly or don't uh the where the author is not so straightforward in presenting that what they the ideas conveyed are wiccan this book is one of those i've read other books by dj conway where she does the same thing she presents a lot of her a lot of what she writes about in terms of magic and spirituality and various paths through a Wiccan lens. And then it's all, it's a little bit iffy for me because I get annoyed. It's like, it's confusing. You need to be clear about the, the traditions that you're speaking on. She will speak on historical or cultural Celtic ideas. And she's really speaking on Wiccan ideas and traditions and it's at the it's to the expense of the celtic of the how do i want to put this 
some of it feels almost false or embellished because she wants it to fit within Wiccan confines, if that makes any sense. All the same, I still enjoyed it. There's a lot of value here. It's one of those beginner magical books for somebody looking to enter a witchy path. So there's a lot in terms of correspondences, gods and goddesses. This, of course, has a Celtic flair, so you're learning about various elements in Celtic culture and the history there, um, as well as magical practices that are more traditional in that nature. So I enjoyed it. Do I think that this book is one that I'm going to return to and use in the future for my own practice? No. Was it a valuable one to have read? Yes. So if you come across it, it's nice. It's one that you can probably re read in a sitting or two, quick read, and it's just a nice book. One of those sort of classic witch books. Not classic as in going way back, but you, that era of Wicca, when Wicca was at its, when it was booming in terms of literature in what feels like the 90s and early 2000s. So then next, the third and last book I read this month was Subtle Worlds and Explorers Field Notes by David Spangler. This is my second book by David Spangler. I read his Conversations with the She. This the structuring is very different. So this is just written, it is written a lot like field notes. So it's broken into chapters. Subtle, subtle worlds are essentially non-physical. So things like nature spirits and angels, as he calls them, and he defines those even more so in terms of a less religious context. But it's basically anything that, any being that isn't physical. So this could be non-incarnated, human entities and your soul this could be an elemental this could be there's a lot of things going into this his he's basically presenting his findings in terms of work with the subtle worlds things beyond the physical and presenting them in a way that is helping you to explore and question and interact with them yourself he's very adamant about the fact that it is a subjective experience so what he's speaking on is his experience alone and that he wants you to sort of make findings for yourself and to not take anything in here for as holy writ, so to speak. So I really enjoyed it. He gives some really useful exercises. His experience, I think, is very valuable. It's similar to Conversations with the She, just in his writing style, of course. But whereas Conversations with the She was more of a transcription of an interaction with a being, this is just his voice broken up into chapters on various topics like I would say where he talks about the transitional realms that are between say the physical and something that's farther beyond. He speaks on exercises, he speaks on self-sovereignty and getting in touch with oneself as an important exercise to prepare for working with subtle beings and the subtle world. So there's a lot of value in this book if any of that sounds interesting to you and those sorts of practices in terms of spirituality and magic appeal to you at all. I really enjoyed it and would recommend it. So that brings us to the end of the books. We have a little bit in terms of lifestyle type stuff. First, I will say I just binge watched this channel's videos, almost all of them, or at least there's a series of sort of vlog style videos. And the channel is, and this is so random, it has nothing to do with the sorts of topics that I speak about really, but uh, Isabel Page. I'll put her name and how it's spelled on the screen. That's the name. That's her name and the name of the channel. And I've just found it really inspiring and relaxing. And she's just someone who sort of wants to live off the grid and be super sustainable and lives on a farm. And she shares recipes and she does yoga and meditates and contemplates life and meaning and trying to find happiness outside of materiality. And I found it really inspiring. There's recipes, there's just a lot of cinematic elements, so each one feels like a little short film. So if any of that sounds interesting, I've just found it really relaxing during these times. So I'll put her name on the screen and I'll link the channel down below. I've just found them really helpful and wonderful to watch. And the recipes are kind of cool too. Not that I can really do all of them because I don't have all of the ingredients, but wonderful channel. Just wanted to bring that one up it's a favorite so next is one that I know I've shown before this is my favorite Earl Grey tea by Sullivan Street Tea and Spice Company and so I order this online when I used to live in the city I would just go and get it it's 
they're based in, I believe, yeah, they're just based in Manhattan or New York City. So if you're interested, they have a website where you can buy the teas and spices. And they also have some like spiritual stuff that I didn't think about um, or didn't see until this past time on their website, just like clearing kits and offering bowls and little things like that. So that's kind of cool too. But I really, this is my favorite tea in the entire world. I will go so far out of my way to get this, even though their teas and spices are a little bit on the pricey side, this is one I'm willing to always pay a little bit extra for. So definitely a favorite for me if you are into teas at all and trying new ones and finding really good quality teas, I highly recommend. Next is this sandalwood essential oil. And I haven't necessarily been using this in magical workings directly, but I will take baths where I'll like have a bubble bath where I'll pour in whatever bubble bath mix I get from like the drugstore, but I'll pour some of this in as well, the, the sandalwood. So I guess in a way it is a magical working. I consider them more ritual baths or magical baths. Sometimes I'll bring a crystal as well, whether it's like rose quartz or amethyst, usually something that's very loving, soothing, and the sandalwood just relaxes me. The scent of it relaxes me. And the way that the scent of the essential oil sort of lingers on me when I get out of the bath, as I usually will do these at night and then I'll go to bed after and I'm very relaxed by the scent. And then I will just be able to smell it on myself into the next morning right before I shower. So I found that to be really, really nice and a definite favorite, something that helps me to sleep and also something that just makes me feel good and relaxed and almost like an aroma and yeah, like aromatherapy. So definite favorite there. And then the final thing I will mention is just my journal and these pens. So my journal is always a favorite, or at least it has been the past few months. I've been very consistent, so I haven't even missed a day in June, which I'm proud of myself for. But my journal is a favorite, and recently I've been getting more into coloring in the journal, and not coloring as in doodles, although sometimes I will do that as well. But just embellishing with color, whatever color feels right, sometimes I'll go back and I will almost write around the words that I've already written in colors that feel applicable to the section. So if the section feels very energized and warm and zesty, I might choose orange. If the section is more about um, nature and it's soothing and it makes me feel calm, I might do something with the green. So it's really about the emotions and the feelings or maybe sort of like an elemental aspect and I'll use the colors to depict and sort of map out the writing so when I go back and reflect in my journal I can see how I was feeling at given moments based on the colors I used to, de to depict that feeling. So I found that to be an interesting practice and so these are definite favorites as well. So that brings us to the end. Those are my favorites. I hope you all enjoyed this. I always enjoy watching other people's favorites so I'm sure if you have one out there I've probably watched it or will watch it and let me know what some of your favorite things have been recently decks and tools magical tools and channels all of that good stuff I'm always looking for recommendations and until next time bye everyone